Hello everyone. In this particular chapter, we're going to be talking about capital assets and we will also be going through some journal entries dealing with the Capital Projects Fund. Okay, so first of all, what is a capital asset? In this course, you need to think of capital assets as fixed assets. Whenever I use the word capital in this class, that's what I want you to think of. So capital assets are going to include land, buildings, land and building improvements, construction work in progress, which is a very, uh, very, very large category for local governments, vehicles, machinery, equipment, um, works of art and historical treasures. We won't talk too much about that because it doesn't affect local governments too much. Infrastructure assets is huge, and then of course intangible assets. So fixed assets, they are paid for in a number of ways. They can simply buy them outright with cash, or they can go get a loan from the bank. But a lot of times, um, the government will go out and they'll issue debt called bonds. They will go out to the investing market and bondholders will let the local government borrow money to do the to buy the capital asset or most likely construct the capital asset and of course the payback will be principal and interest over the long term so capital assets come in many different forms and we will be studying that as we look at this particular chapter so where do we account for general capital assets once again I want you to zone in on this word general in the title I'm not talking about all capital assets. I'm talking about those general or uh, basically uh, core government activities. Anything that would be associated or paid for with property taxes. So if it's just as simple buying a computer for the mayor's office or the accountant's office or something like that, you would use a general fund. And when the asset is purchased in the actual general fund, special revenue fund, whatever governmental fund you're going to use, you would actually record an expenditure. And we would record cash, assuming credit cash if we bought it for cash. Um, the capital projects fund is used when we have a long-term construction project. So as an example, we're building a new city hall or we're building a new police station or fire station, something along those lines. We would account for those expenditures in a capital projects fund. And as the journal entry of the expenditures are recorded in the governmental funds, at the same time in the government wide statements, which use accrual accounting, we would account for the actual fixed asset itself and we would depreciate it over its useful life. Once again, huge difference between the governmental funds using modified accrual recording the expenditure up front versus the accrual accounting at the government wide level where we actually record the fixed asset and we will depreciate it over its useful life. Now, let me just stop before I move over to the next slide. Once again, I'm talking about general capital assets here. I'm not talking about all capital assets. So if we have capital assets associated with one of the proprietary funds, say it's the golf course enterprise fund, if they have assets, they're going to record it themselves in their fund using accrual accounting. So once again, the general capital assets recorded as an expenditure in the respective governmental fund and recorded as an actual fixed asset in the accrual based government wide statements. Just like you saw in your other accounting classes, they are typically recorded at historical cost. Um, in the governmental fund, as I said, we're going to record the expenditure, but in the government wide statements, we will capitalize. Uh, up front when we buy or construct the fixed asset and we will depreciate it over its useful life. So once again, the, the government wide statements that use accrual accounting, the accounting is very similar to what you learned in other, your other accounting classes. Recording the expenditure up front, which is a modified accrual concept. This is new for the governmental funds. Okay, land. We all know what land is. We can either purchase the land 
or the land could be forfeited. As an example, we can have a landowner and they just did not pay their property tax bill. Well, eventually the city is going to take over uh, that land and that land will be owned by the city um, if the taxes are never paid. And then of course, land could also be donated. If the land is donated, it's gonna be recorded in the government-wide statements at the fair market value or the appraised value at the date of donation. Okay, uh, we have buildings and building improvements. I should say, uh, yeah, buildings and building improvements. Um, they, once again, they're recorded uh, as we purchase them or construct them. And so here we go, we can purchase the building. It would be the contract price and all the closing costs or constructed. If we construct it, um, we can either use outside contractors and of course their contract price and all the costs, or if we self-construct, we're gonna have our, our direct and indirect expenditures. That would be uh, the equipment, the supplies, it could be the labor. It could be the hands-on labor versus the supervisory labor. But in any event, that's all gonna get capitalized as part of the building for the government-wide statements for the fund financial statements, they will be recorded as capital expenditures. And lastly, just like land could be donated, so could buildings. And if a building is donated to the city, it will be recorded as an asset in the government-wide statements at the fair market value at the date of donation. Machinery and equipment, uh, more of the same. And like I said earlier, construction work in progress, or you will hear me say WIP, W-I-P, this is a very, very, very common activity for a local government. And for those of you that are just aware of your day-to-day -day movement, if you look around, you will almost always see some sort of uh, construction going on at the local government level. Have you all noticed that... Um, Governments are improving lighting systems on the roadways or they're expanding the roadways or they're building a new sidewalk or they're building a new park or refurbishing a park or building a new city hall, a new police station, new library. If you look around town, you will honestly see this. And those are all government construction projects. They would be accounted for as it, most likely in a capital projects fund, number one, as expenditures, as we are spending the money, and they will be capitalized in the government-wide statements in this WIP account, construction work in progress, which is part of the capital assets. Next, infrastructure. Infrastructure, basically the, the roadway system, the lighting system, they're stationary in nature, and the interesting thing about infrastructure is infrastructure could be preserved for a long time, all right? Infrastructure assets do not have to be depreciated if we use what's known as a modified approach. And if you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you think about the sidewalk in front of your house, and I don't know how long your house has been there. Maybe your house has been there for 50 years or 60 years. And you think about that sidewalk in front of your house, which is most likely owned by the local city. Um, have you ever thought, how does the government depreciate that sidewalk? I'm sure the thought never crossed your mind because it's probably a silly thought. Uh, how about, let's take, a, a, let's take a New York City. Think about the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, I would guess all of us have either been on the Brooklyn Bridge or at a minimum, we have seen it on TV. This is, a, this is a pretty much an iconic bridge that as soon as we've seen a photo of it, we say, oh yeah, I know that. Well, have you ever thought to yourself, how does New York City depreciate the Brooklyn Bridge? I'm sure none of you have ever asked that question. The bottom line is what I'm saying, the sidewalk in front of your house, the Brooklyn Bridge, the streetway, the highway, these are all known as infrastructure. They're stationary. They could be preserved for a long amount of time. And if this modified approach is selected, we do not need to depreciate those fixed assets. And I'm not going to read word for word these couple of slides here talking about the modified approach, but let me just summarize it by saying this. If the government 
knows where all their infrastructure is and they have a maintenance schedule that they follow religiously. They're constantly maintaining these infrastructure assets. Then the thought process is these fixed assets are going to have as close to an indefinite life as you can get. So as long as that maintenance program is there and they're constantly following it, these infrastructure assets do not need to be depreciated. So that's basically what the modified approach states. Okay. Um, leases. So we could have a lease. And basically, if we have a capital lease, we would record at the government-wide level, we would record an asset and we would record a long-term liability for the capital lease. Now, if we incur costs after acquisitions, uh, very similar to your prior accounting classes, if they actually add to the function of the asset, we can capitalize that. But if it's just simply a normal repair and maintenance item, that would be an expenditure um, for the, I'm sorry, an expense for the government-wide statements. Clearly, everything is an expenditure for the governmental fund using modified accrual accounting, but the difference is at the government-wide level. If it's uh, adding to the utility or the function of the capital asset, we will actually capitalize that cost. If not, it's just a normal period expense. Okay, And then, of course, if there is a permanent write-down of the asset because of an impairment, we would indeed do so by recording an impairment loss. Okay. All right. Now let's take a look at some journal entries in a capital projects fund. Once again, the capital projects fund is a governmental fund. Governmental funds use modified accrual accounting. And just like we saw in the prior chapters, we're going to see journal entries. And before the journal entry, you are going to see um, where the journal entry is recorded. It's either recorded in the governmental fund or the governmental activities column on the government-wide statements. If the same journal entry in both, you will see it written out just like this, just like journal entry one. You can see it's recorded both in the fire station capital projects fund and the government-wide statements. All right, so basically what's going on here is the city is going to build a new fire station. And they got to get the project started with an architect and maybe some engineering uh, costs. And so what they're going to do is they're going to go to the bank and get a short-term loan. So the journal entry, both on the governmental fund, the capital projects fund, as well as the government-wide statements, it will be the same. Debit cash, credit, short-term notes payable. Remember the key, the key concept of Modified accrual is we can only record current assets and current liabilities. This is indeed a current liability, so it has the ability to be recorded. Okay, after the contract, I'm sorry, after the uh, the initial architect fees are, are uh, after the original loan, I should say, from the bank to pay for architect fees, etc., then the uh, government is going to go out and they're going to sign a contract with their uh, their builder. And so, as we learned in the prior chapters, that the governmental fund will actually encumber those funds. And the encumbrance, once again, reduces the available budget balance. It puts a placeholder on the budget money, very similar to an actual expenditure does. So we're going to debit encumbrances and credit encumbrances outstanding. Journal entry three is the same as two. Once again, the encumbrance is only recorded on the fund itself. It's not recorded in the government-wide statements. The encumbrance outstanding is a temporary, kind of like a carve-out to one of the fund balance accounts. Okay, now some of the funds are being spent. So out of the $50,000 that we borrowed, now we are spending 48000 of them. Let's say they're architect fees. So in the capital projects fund, using modified accrual, we will debit the expenditure account and credit cash. At the same time, the capital projects fund is recording journal entry 4A. The government-wide statements 
in journal entry 4B at the same time is recording a debit to this WIP account, and this is a fixed asset account, and we will credit cash. Before we move further, I just want to point this out. 4A versus 4B, this would result in what we're going to call a reconciling item. And remember, at the end of the day, when we prepare our financial statements, we need to prepare a reconciliation between equity at the fund level and equity at the government-wide level. Well, this is clearly something that would reduce equity. The expenditure would at the fund level, but in 4B, you can see equity was not affected. So this is an example, this 48,000 of what we're going to call a reconciling item. I'm pointing it out because when we get to chapter, uh, the chapter when we deal with uh, the reconciliations, I want to make that as easy as possible. Okay, now the contractors are doing work for us and they sent us a progress billing. So what you're going to see in the capital projects fund, the governmental fund, you first you're going to see a reversal of the encumbrance. All right, so we're going to debit encumbrance outstanding, credit encumbrance. This is basically a partial reversal of journal entry uh, uh, two and three. All right, and basically what we're going to do is at the same time that we reverse the encumbrance, we're going to record the actual expenditure. So journal entry 5B, we debit the expenditure and credit the liability. And at the same time that the capital projects fund records 5A and 5B, you can see the government-wide statements. We will capitalize that amount as part of the WIP and credit the payable. Once again, 5B versus 5C results in a reconciling item, just like 4A versus 4B did. And now the Capital Projects Fund is, is actually getting a capital grant. So at the fund level, debit cash, credit revenue, and at the same time, but in the government-wide statements, debit cash and the credit is going to go to program revenues. Remember, at the government-wide level, we have to further break out our revenues between either program revenues or general revenues. All grants are program revenues. All right. Now, since some money came in, we got some grant money, now we're able to pay back the bank. Remember that $50,000 that the bank loaned us? So we can pay back the bank, the principal plus the interest. At this point in time, there is $1,000 of interest that is owed. So on the capital projects fund, debit interest expenditure, debit the note payable, credit cash. At the same time, journal entry 7B, you can see the journal entry is fairly similar at the government-wide level. We just don't use the term expenditure. Instead, we're going to call it interest expense. All right, now some big money comes in. So the Capital Projects Fund, they went to the bond market and they received $1.2 million in bonds. So in the Capital Projects Fund, debit cash. And since the bond payable is a long-term liability, we can't credit the long-term liability because of the modified accrual accounting. So the Capital Projects Fund, instead of crediting bonds payable, we're going to credit other financing sources. Remember, other financing sources is, is similar to other revenue. It's something that would actually be recorded in the operating statement and it would increase the fund balance. At the same time, 8A is recorded in the fund and the government-wide statements, debit cash, credit, bonds payable. You can see that this is a reconciling situation. The $1.2 million increases equity at the fund level, but there's no change in equity at the government-wide level with the bonds payable. All right. Now we can see we are paying our contractor, and this would be the same journal entry in the fund as well as the government-wide statements. Debit contracts payable, credit cash. All right, journal entry 10A. Um, another progress billing came in from our contractors. So 10A is to reverse the encumbrance. Debit encumbrance outstanding, credit encumbrance, and we will replace it immediately with the actual expenditure. And that's what journal entry 10B is. 
debit the expenditure, credit cash. And at the same time, the governmental fund records 10B, the government-wide statements will record 10C. And you can see using accrual accounting, we would debit the actual asset account and credit cash. Keep in mind that the encumbrance and the actual expenditure does not necessarily mean need to be the exact same dollar amount. However, it should be close. And in this case, it is close. Maybe there was a discount that was offered us after the signing of the contract, and which would be the difference between the encumbrance, which was the, basically the contract amount, and the actual expenditure. Oops, sorry, I went too fast there. Journal entry 11A and 11B and 11C are the same as 10A, 10B, and 10C. Another progress billing came in, so the Capital Projects Fund will reverse the encumbrance, as you see here in 11A. In 11B, it would replace it with the actual expenditure. And at the same time, as the Capital Projects Fund is recording 11B, the government-wide statements will record 11C to capitalize the amount as the WIP and credit the liability. And then we have the fire station paying the contractor and the same journal entry in the fund as well as the government-wide debit contracts payable, credit cash. And um, here are the closing entries at the end of the year. We will close our revenue and our other financing source accounts with debits. And you can see we, we basically received $1.5 million. Um, we spent one million four hundred ninety-three thousand. So we will we will close out the construction expenditures with a credit, as well as the interest of a thousand dollars with a credit. The difference to balance the entry, debit or credit, whatever is needed to fund balance. Now you see it says fund balance restricted, and remember, restricted fund balance means that monies we received are either. Um, they're either dictated by law or dictated by a third party on how to spend those funds. Well, the 300000 is grant money. The $1.2 is bond money. Both the bondholders and the grantor have dictated how we spend these money. So this is clearly restricted. And since we spent $6,000 less than what we received and the project is done, we can then take the $6,000 excess that we have in the bank and we can transfer it out to another fund. Most likely, this $6,000 at this point is going to the debt service fund because they're going to need all the help they can get at this point. So we will debit other financing uses for the transfer out and credit cash and journal entry 14B would be to close out the other financing uses with a credit and that means we would debit the restricted fund balance. <clears throat> and last but not least, since the project is done in the government-wide statements, we can get rid of the WIP account with a credit, and in its place, we will debit the buildings account. And at this point forward, since the building is brand new, that building account will be depreciated over its useful life in the government-wide statements. So those are typical journal entries at dealing with a capital projects fund. Okay, now what you saw when we were going through those journal entries is uh, a lot of times the capital projects fund is funded by bond money. And as you learn from your other accounting classes, bonds can be issued at par, <coughs> but they can also be issued at a premium or a discount. Now, if a bond is sold at a premium, a lot of times that premium money is not kept in the capital projects fund. A lot of time that premium money is sent immediately to the debt service fund. Because what you're going to see is the capital projects fund and the debt service fund, they work very closely together. You're going to find that the capital projects fund they build the they collect money they spend the money they build the project and they are done but what's left over is usually a whole bunch of debt principal and interest that needs to be paid back sometimes over 30 years or more and so the debt service fund you can see that they're kind of like the cleanup 
after the capital projects fund has their fun, right? And then the debt service fund is the cleanup, right? Have to be there, the responsible fund over all those years making all the payments. So sometimes I, I need you to understand that uh, bond premiums or discounts, they would be recorded as other financing sources if it's a premium, other financing use if it's a discount. But those monies most likely, at least the premium money, would ultimately go to the debt service fund pretty quickly. And of course, if we sell bonds in between interest payment dates, we're going to collect um, interest from our bondholders, very similar to what you learned in your prior accounting classes. And we'll collect that extra interest from the last interest payment date to the sale date of the bond. And then, of course, on the first date of the interest payment, we will pay back the bondholders a full amount of interest. And basically, we're paying them back some of the interest that they prepaid us. Retained percentage. This is something that's pretty unique as well to capital projects. A lot of times when you're dealing with long-term construction projects, whenever you get a progress billing from your contractor, you typically don't pay that in full. And typical industry norm is you are going to pay 95% of all your invoice amount, but you're going to withhold 5%. That is called retain percentage. And what we're going to do is the amount we hold back, we will put in a separate liability account called contracts payable dash retain percentage. And that amount is going to stay in that account until final sign off of the project. There's a lot of there's a lot of sign offs that we need to go through. But when we finally get the certificate of occupancy and we can actually use the asset that we're constructing, we will then remit any retained percentages to the contractor. This is very common for contracts. Okay, sometimes the government knows that a project needs to start today, but they can't get bond money for another six months or nine months or maybe another year, year and a half. So if there is a timing difference between when the contract needs to start today versus when we can get our bond money, a lot of times the bank will go, I'm sorry, the government will go out to a bank to get a loan, a loan that can get, a, get us from today when we need to start construction until the bond money comes in. That is called a bond anticipation note payable. Once again, this is a loan from the bank in anticipation of the bond money coming in. If it is a short-term notes payable, we will debit cash and credit notes payable in the capital projects fund, as well as the uh, government-wide statements. All right. Now, if the capital projects fund, um, it, take a look at these two rectangles at the bottom of your screen. If all legal steps have been taken to refinance the note, and the intent is supported by an ability to consummate refinancing the note on a long-term basis. Let me put this in plain English. If we have taken all of our legal steps to get that bond money, and uh, we're simply just in a waiting game to actually get the bond, to get the bond money, if all that has taken place, we can record this short-term bond anticipation note as if it was long-term. And what that means is instead of crediting bonds payable, I'm sorry, notes payable, what you're going to be able to credit is other financing sources in the capital projects fund. Now, once again, on the government wide statements, it doesn't matter. We're always going to record that that liability, that notes payable. But in the capital projects fund, which follows modified accrual accounting, you can only record current liabilities. Here's an exception to that. If these two uh, rectangles, the items and the, the rectangles are present, then we are indeed going to record the credit to other financing sources instead of note payable 